So why don't we take a minute and let's pray, and then we'll go on from there. So Father, we just want to say thank you, Lord, for your heart. Thank you for your precious word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord, that brings to life the words uh, on the pages of the Bible, Lord, to us. Lord God, you give us understanding. Lord, open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, Lord, for all those who are still kind of laying in bed, wondering if they should tune in, should they shouldn't they draw them to yourself right now in Jesus' name, Lord God. Draw us all to you, Jesus, for you are the life changer, Lord. You you are the love giver, Lord God. You are the bringer of salvation and the lifter of our head, Lord. So we ask for your Holy Spirit to blanket this whole thing. We ask for your word that is alive, that you would make it alive to us, Lord, that we can understand it. So help me anoint my mind, my eyes, my tongue to only say those things that you want me to say, Lord, and nothing else, Lord God. And no one, no one else, Lord, just about you and your word and your heart. I ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen and amen. All right. Well, if you would, uh, open your Bibles to Psalm 1. And if you're at home right now, that means that you get up off the couch. I know you're comfy. You got your blankie. You got your PJs. You got your coffee. Whatever it is, get up off the couch. Kids, teens, you too. Go get yourself a Bible. We all need to have God's word, not only uh, in our hands, but so we can read it. Faith comes by hearing, also by hearing by the word of God. But we want you to see it. We want you to hear it. We want you to, to turn the pages. And, uh, or, or if you have your phone, you can do that. Or your iPad, however you do it. Go take a minute and get that and then open to Psalm 1. So get your iPad, get your Bibles, open it to your Bible app. And turn to Psalm 1 is where we want to be. Now, Psalms is uh, an amazing book of the Bible. And uh, the Hebrew title for Psalm is Tehillim. And, uh, Tehillim, and that means praise. Or some might say it uh, in the Hebrew Bible, the book of praises. I think that's Sifar Tehillim. It means the book of praises. And so the Psalms are all about praises to our Lord. And there's different types of Psalms, and we're not going to get into that today. But it's the largest book in the Bible. It's, it's, it's the biggest uh, book in the entire Bible. And, and it's got... Uh, Basically, 2,461 verses and 40,000 words, 40,000 plus words. You can Google that. And, uh, and it's the most quoted uh, Old Testament book in the New Testament. The Old Testament is quoted approximately 263 times, and it's quoted 116 times. There's so much stuff in the Psalms, yet it's kind of an overlooked book. And I'll be honest with you, I, uh, I don't know if there's a theme to the whole book of Psalms, but what I would say is a general theme, like what I get out of it when I read it, it's life is hard, but my God is good. Amen. And that's where I go um, when I'm struggling, when I'm either rejoicing in the Lord and praising or I'm hurting or I'm sad or struggling, I immediately go to the Psalms and start reading a Psalm a day or so, two Psalms a day. And I just let it refresh me and renew me. You see so much raw emotions in the Psalm. You, you see uh, not just the character of God and theology and history and all that kind of stuff. And, but you, you also see the real, uh, how, how we interact with God relationally. You see the mistakes, you know, David will one minute say, Oh God, I don't know where you're at. You've left me. You don't care about me. And then he'll go back at the end of the Psalm saying, but I know you're really right there. And I know you haven't left me. And that's so great. So let the Psalms encourage you. Don't neglect that book. Today, we're going to be in um, Psalm chapter 1. And that's what I felt the Lord had put on my heart uh, a couple of weeks ago. Now, uh, a lot of folks wrote the Psalms. Um, uh, David um, wrote basically 72 or 73 of them. Uh, the sons of Korah wrote about 11. Asap wrote 12. King Solomon wrote two psalms, Psalm 72 and Psalm 127. And then I think uh, Ethan wrote one and Moses, I think, wrote one as well. I think it was Psalm 90. But anyway, um, there's a bunch that we don't know who wrote them. And, and Psalm 1 is one of those books. We don't know who wrote them. Some think maybe it was Ezra. Some think maybe it was David. Or, but we don't know. But one thing we do know 
is it's the Holy Spirit. God wrote this book through whatever human instrument he wrote. It's God that wrote this psalm, and he wrote it for us, and he put it at the beginning here for a reason. You know, if you look in the very uh, center, uh, or I shouldn't say the very center of psalms, because that's not true. What's very central to psalms, the longest chapter in the Bible, is actually Psalm 119, and it's all about the Word of God. It is such an amazing chapter. In Psalm 1, here at the very beginning, it's also central, because this is going to help us to be able to go through through or help us to be able to go through the rest of the Psalms. Not that we're going to do that right now. I don't know. I'm I'm just saying, but it helps us to interpret the rest of the Psalms. And so we're going to go through Psalm one together. Now, if you have your Bibles open, we're just going to read through it once. It's only six verses. Uh, Of course, you know me though. I talk a lot. So hopefully we'll be able to get through uh, all six verses. Uh, Let's read it once and then we'll, we'll kind of uh, exegete it. Here we go. It says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and on it he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are light chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked would perish. If there's a key verse in Psalm 1, I would say that that verse 6 is it. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. There's a contrast here. Now, I don't know if you notice this, but in your Bible, I want you to, if you do this kind of thing, I circle, highlight, I don't know if you can see it, but the very first word in this psalm says blessed, and the very last word uh, says perish. And that basically, to me, shows us the two different lives. One, a child of God who is seeking after the Lord and desires to please him and to honor him. And the other one that desires the things of the world and wants to run after that. One is going to be blessed with eternal life and one is going to perish in eternal hellfire. That's the bottom line. I know that's not a popular thing to talk about, but that's the truth of it. So to me, when I look at Psalm 1, even this little... PowerPoint picture that I put up here, I see uh, a blessed way and I see a perishing way. And, and in Psalm 1, I, I, see, I see two ways of thinking as, as we look through this. We're going to see that. Uh, the Bible talks about in James that there are two types of wisdom uh, that the Bible talks about. And that is not it. So we'll give it just a second. Okay. The Bible talks about basically two types of wisdom. James 3.17 says there's there's a wisdom uh, um, from God and there's a wisdom from the world. The the wisdom of God is going to lead us down a certain path in life. And it says in James 3.17 that the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. That's what God's word is. It's pure. It's peace loving. It's considerate. It's submissive. It's full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. And God wants us all to bear fruit. Psalm 1 even talks about that. But there's also a, a wisdom from the world, a way of doing things, a way of speaking, a way of thinking, a way of, of, of going about our relationships, our, our businesses, and, and things like that, our, 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 our places at school, how we conduct ourselves. That's not of the Lord. And it's the wisdom of the world. Now, God says this in 1 Corinthians 3.19, that the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. Now, they think that they're so smart, that they're ripping off, they're lying and scheming, and, and that's how the world works. That's how I used to work before I was saved. But that wisdom, the Bible says in James 3.15, doesn't come from heaven, but it's earthly It's unspiritual. And in fact, Zoinkaramas, the Bible says that kind of wisdom 
is demonic. Zoinks. So that's not a way that we want to be thinking, that we want to be living, that we want to be acting, that we want to be behaving. That's not the way that we want to go as Christians. Psalm 1 basically tells us when I look at it, that we've got a choice to make. When I look at it, we've got two paths. We can either choose the blessed way or the perishing way. Now, the blessed way might be a little bit less traveled. It might be a little more rocky on this planet, but let me tell you, the destination is about a bazillion times better than the other road. So we have a choice to make. I have a choice to make. You do. There are times, you know what? Honestly, if I could just be blunt honest, I wish I could make that choice for you. I, I, I do. But I can't. You have to choose who you're going to follow and what path you're going to take. Basically, when I look at Psalm 1 and when we go through it, the question kind of goes, and, and to me it's, it's like a, uh, a question I would picture on the road. Will the road that you're on lead you to my place? Is what you're doing, how you're thinking, what you're consumed with, is that going to lead you to him? Or is that really leading you away from him? That's a question that you really have to ask yourself. That's a question I have to ask myself, right? Is that road that I'm on going to lead you to him? Now, now listen, let's, let's, let's start us off. And uh, also, if you don't have a pen or if you don't have a highlighter, I would get that. Man, I don't mean any. I circle, highlight. I just love the Word of God. And so in my Bibles, I've always got tons of markings and writings. And, and so the very first verse says this. I'll, I'll just read it and then we'll go through it. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. So the very first word, look at your Bibles. The very first word is what? Blessed, right? Blessed. Now, so we kind of have to ask ourselves, or I ask me, what does that mean? Okay, blessed is the, well, what does it mean to be blessed, right? Now, the Hebrew word is, sounds like the artist, Esher, okay? The Hebrew word for blessed is Esher, and, and that means well, it has different meanings. One of the translations is, is happy. And, and, and so it's saying happy is, is the man who does not walk in the council of the world. But I don't like that for our day and age. And let me tell you why. Because happiness is fleeting with our circumstances. In other words, let me, let me give you an example. Uh, before I had to have my surgery and have my kidney, re- kidney removed, um, <clears throat> We, my wife had arranged this absolutely beautiful time at this place that we go in Orlando. And, and it's a window, and we're just going to spend it together. The older kids uh, were with uh, my, my dad at home. The younger kids were with Lisa's uh, dad at his home. And we had the whole weekend to ourselves. And so I was so happy. We had a fantastic time. And it was just a beautiful, wonderful time being together, going on walks, sitting, having nachos over the water. It was just a great time. I was so happy. We drove home happy as a clam. I pull into the driveway and as I'm pulling in, everybody comes out of the driveway. Now, you know, when that happens, something's bad. And there's a look on the face of at least one of the folks that says, I I don't know if you get this, but I did something really bad. (laughs) Right, right. We are not even out of the car yet. And then I take a look at, at, I should say the van, because my car is, my car was really not, it kept up and the engine run. And I notice that my car is smashed up. (laughs) And I find out that not only is it smashed up, but it's undrivable. In fact, not only is it undrivable, but it's completely totaled. Now, praise the Lord that the person inside who was trying to do me a favor while I was gone and use my vehicle and and do something to to help, uh, somebody had ran a red light and basically smashed into two cars. Uh, And what happened was they totaled my car. And so I come back and my car is smashed to bits. And on top of that, that person doesn't have 
insurance or has a tiny, tiny bit of insurance, which is only going to give me a tiny, tiny bit on my car, which I intended to pass on to the kids and last for years to come. So I went from super happy to super not happy. You see how that fades? Now, being blessed or Escher in, in the Bible it is deeper than that. It means joyful. It's a deep seated, I don't know, satisfaction, contentment in God and who He is. You're a recipient of God's divine blessing. That's what being blessed is. You are joyful regardless of what happens. You, you are, are blessed by God regardless of whether uh, the, the car doesn't start or you got the flat tire or you lose the job whatever the case may be you know what you are blessed by him so when I look at that and when I see that that deep rooted contentment in God that's what being blessed is and, and when, I, when I look at that word you can also get definitions too from, from the Bible itself in, in Psalm that, this word Esher blessed you see it 26 times in the Bible Excuse me, not in the Bible, 26 times in the Psalms. Okay, so listen, I'm just going to, we're not going to go through all 26, so nobody panic. We're just going to go through a couple, because sometimes it's nice to let the Bible define what the word means. Because sometimes I've met a lot of people or quote unquote Christians, I don't know, some are, some aren't, I don't know, that say, I'm blessed, I'm, and that usually what they're saying, they've got lots of money, they've got lots of stuff, they're, they're kind of thinking in the physical instead of in the spiritual. But let's see how God defines it, and you can see if you track with me, okay? Let's see how God defines blessed in the Psalms, okay? Here we go. Psalm 32, 1 verses 2. This is what a blessed person is going to be like. A recipient of God's divine favor. <laughs> I love this. And I love this slide. It says, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Man, that's what being blessed is. That all my transgressions are forgiven. What? How many does this say, guys? If you're at home, blessed is one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are what? Covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. They're all forgiven. They're all covered because of the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed on that cross for you and for me because I received him. I have eternal life. I am blessed. All the sins, everything that I've done, past, present, and future, covered by the blood of the Lamb. Holy schmolies! That's what being blessed is about. It goes on to say that blessed is the one whose sin the Lord doesn't count against them. Man, I don't know about you, but doggone it, I'm a sinner. I am a sinner. You know what? I, I would be an excellent life coach on how to do things bad. I could be like the evil life coach, apart from the Holy Spirit of God taking over my life, changing my mind, heart, direction, and the way I go. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord doesn't count against them and whose spirit there's no deceit. That's what being blessed is. Being blessed is in 34, 8, he says, taste and see, see for yourself. Receiving Jesus Christ and, 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 and not walking in the counsel of the wicked. See what that does for you. Taste it. See it. That the Lord, he's good. And blessed is the man or woman who takes refuge in him. So being blessed, God is your refuge, your, your ever-present help in times of trouble. A place to run to that's safe when if nobody understands you. If nobody cares. Let me tell you something. Jesus cares. And he is there for you always. Boy, I'm getting excited and I'm yelling. I'm sorry. I realize I shouldn't be yelling because the folks at the phone are like, well, we got to turn down the volume. Why is he yelling so much? I'm sorry. I just get excited about the scriptures. I get excited about God's word. Well, listen to this. Psalm 65, 4 says, blessed, Esher, same word again. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near. Can, can you believe it? Listen, I, I'm going to say it because I've known him for a long George. God chose you to bring him, bring you to himself. Can you believe it? I know you. Can you believe the Lord chose me to bring me near? Isn't that incredible? Thank you, Lord. And he chose you, Gary, Nate Weave, 
Jay, you at home, he chose you to dwell in your courts. And it says, look at this. We shall be satisfied. I love that. With the goodness of your house and the holiness of your temple. That's the deep-seated contentment that comes from I know God. Whatever hits me, whatever comes my way, I trust in him. Listen, when I, when I first was told, hey, I have to have my, my kidney removed. There's a mass on there. They think it's cancerous. We got to do it. It's an emergency. Radical nephrectomy, I think, is what the technical name is. What they had. Let me tell you something. I believe in God's healing 100%. I have had people lay hands on me and heal. I have healed countless times. I don't, I don't know why God chooses to do it, or I know that he does. But God said to me, I need you to go through this. You're going to have to go through this. And I told a couple people that, not very many, but just a couple. And when he told me that, I thought, okay, well, you know what? I'm content in that. I'm satisfied. Now, the going through it wasn't so easy. I'll tell you that another time. But there was a deep-seated contentment that came regardless of whether I lived or died because I trust in the Lord because I know that I'm blessed. And so are you if you choose to trust in him and walk in his ways. Amen? Oh, listen to this. And, and you go back to your Bible. In verse one. Oh boy. It starts off, blessed is the man. Okay, blessed is the man. Now the Hebrew word there is esh, where it says man. Okay, now I got to say this because in context, what, in context, what it means is the individual. Blessed is the individual. Blessed is the person. I don't want anybody thinking, well, this doesn't apply to me or, oh, I guess the Bible is sexist. No, it means individual. It means person. It means one. So you could say blessed is the one just like we see here. Blessed is the one you choose to bring near. Okay, it's talking about men, women, children, whatever, whoever you are. It says, blessed is the man. And I, and I love what Spurgeon said here. He says, it is not blessed is the king on this verse, or blessed is the scholar, or blessed is the rich, like some TV preachers would say, but blessed is the man, the one, the person, the individual, any of us. This blessedness is as attainable by the poor and the forgotten and the obscure as those whose names figure in history and are trumpeted by fame. Wow. So that means blessed is any of us. That's amazing to me. I, I, that blows me away. It says, blessed is the man, or blessed is the one, verse 1 in Psalm says, who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Now, if you have a Bible, and again, I keep going back to that because you should, I, I also circled who. See, it says, blessed is the man, or blessed is the one who. Do you see that in your Bibles? Who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked? Who? Right? Because this is important, and, and I don't know, this is like a key that unlocks something. And that key, who, and then it goes on to say what it is, that unlocks a secret here. Because who are you, or more importantly, whose are you, determines where you're going to walk in this path in Psalms. Who are you? Whose are you? Are you the Lord? Listen, if somebody said to you, if somebody said to you right now, who are you? Okay, I'm, I'm going to pretend I'm asking me this question. So this is going to be a little weird, but okay. So tell me, who are you? Well, I'm Darren Shettlebauer. N no, they would say, that's, that's your name. Who are you? Well, I'm Pastor Darren. I'm a pastor. No, that's what you do. Who are you? At the core of your being, at the center of your soul, who are you? And you know who I am? I am a child of the king, baby. I am a child of the king, my friend. I am saved. I am his. So who are you? There was a song. Oh, I'm going to get in trouble here. It was in the 70s. Okay, there was a... Okay, okay. First, there was a band in the 70s and 80s. Okay, and it was called The Who. Okay, some of you might remember it. Yeah, the, <laughs> ha, that was good. And they, and they say, had this song, Who Are You? I don't know if you remember, but it would go, Who? Are you who 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 who? Oh, 
Okay. Well, anyway, there's a, there's actually a story that thank you that goes along with that by uh, the writer of that song, uh, Peter uh, Townsend, I think was his name. And uh, and and the story is when that song got written. The story was that uh, he was spent like 13 hours with all the New York bigwigs, the who, and, 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 and it was a grueling meeting and, and he, and Peter Townsend came out of there and, and it was with all the big record execs and, and, and basically they worked out the deal for their album and their song. And, and, and what happened was uh, he got a monstrous, you know, everything he'd ever wanted, the, a check, royalty checks everything he ever wanted and he walked and he didn't know what to do and he was walking back and he he started to think maybe he sold out and and what he did was he went and again this is an unsafe guy he went and he just got flat flabbergasted drunk because he started thinking maybe i sold out maybe and he got drunk and he ended up in 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 soho new york in in, in a doorway passed out in a drunken stupor and the law, the lawman, a lawman came up to him and recognized who that was in that drunken, dilapidated state in a doorway in Soho, New York, and woke him up and said to him, he said, Pete or Peter Townsend or Mr. Townsend, he said, you know, uh, you have a choice here. You have a choice right now. You can either choose to get up and, and you can choose to go home or you can choose to go to jail. You're going to walk one way or you're going to walk the other. And it's the exact same way when we look at this psalm. We have a choice to make. Who you are and who you choose to be, what choices you make, whose you are is going to make all the difference. Turn in your Bible, if you will. Um, I wonder if I should do that now or later. Pressure, pressure, pressure. I think I'll do it a little bit later. Yeah, I'll do it a little bit later. Um, it says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. I put a little square around the knot. Does not walk in the counsel of the wicked because uh, that is important. Now, that same word... <laughs> The opposite of that, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. The opposite of that is like Psalm 89, 15. Blessed, same word, Asher, are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence. I have learned to walk away from that counsel of the wicked, what they're telling me, what they're, how they're influencing me, and I've learned to walk on that less ro road path, and, 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 and I've learned that. And I walk in the light of your presence. I even love this slide. I, I'm going to hit the lights. I don't know if that's going to screw everybody up on the camera. But even I love when I was making this slide. There's a difference. You can see this girl. She is walking in the light. Do you get it? In a dark world. She's chosen to walk. She's learned to walk in the light of his presence. Listen to this. Oh, this is 1 John 1, 7. I forgot to put the scripture book or something there. But it says... Uh, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we'll have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from how much sin? Oh, isn't that amazing? If we walk, but there's an if. That means a choice again. If we walk in the light, you have the choice. I have the choice. We have the choice to do it. The Bible wants us to, to bear fruit and, to, and to, to make him known. In Colossians 1.10, it says, Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. And the Bible says, Bearing fruit like a tree planted by streams of living water. We'll talk about that maybe in a minute. And increasing in the knowledge of God. That's how he wants us to walk. Thank you. It says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Now, counsel, you guys, when I think of counsel, I think of sitting with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, and, and that does mean that, right? When I think of counsel, counsel means instruction, right? It means advice. It means guidance. It means influence. So the Bible's saying, blessed is the person, the man or the woman, who does not walk and listen to those who are 
counseling them of the world. Not listening to the guidance, not listening to the influence. And that means one-on-one. And that does mean things like we're influenced or we're counseled by our friends. Whether you like it or not, that's the truth. Listen, I, there's, a, oh, there's a scripture, you don't have to go there, but I think it's in Exodus 23. I'm just going to zip there really quickly because it's coming to mind. Exodus 23, 2a says, do not follow the crowd in doing wrong <laughs> because the crowd will lead you astray. Their counsel, their influence is going to drag you in the wrong direction. And everybody who's going in the wrong direction always think, oh, that's not me. That's the other person next to me because they're weak, but I can take it. Foolish, foolish, foolish. Listen, 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, I don't have a slide for this, but it says, bad company corrupts good character. So who you surround yourself with, your friends, your family, those things, whoever you surround yourself with, that's what's going to counsel you. That's who's influencing you. Whether you believe it or understand it or not, your relationships Well, I know he's unsafe, Pastor Darren, but I hope to get him to church. And then, oh my goodness, how many times do I have to hear this and watch it bomb out after a bit of time? It's terrible. Or the workmates or family or whatever. But you're also influenced, right, by the news media. You're counseled by them. Listen, it's the truth. It used to be where the news would inform you of things, right? Right? And now they're really forming you. They're forming your opinions, your thoughts, TV shows. Now we got to include all this electronic stuff, your phone. Listen, what you're putting on your phone, all the social, you know, what you watch on Netflix, the TV shows, that's influencing you in a subtle way. You might not even know it, but before long, you're desensitized to them. Oh, those crass jokes that you would never have listened to, all of a sudden you're listening to them. And in fact, you don't even see anything wrong with it. The stuff you're seeing, first you would kind of turn away. I'll put no vile thing before my eyes, and then all of a sudden you're watching it, and then, yeah, yeah, what's the big deal? Just a body, right? Listen, social media, they even have, I I guess, I'm, I'm not cool, so I don't know, but they even have what's called influencers, right? On YouTube, right? On, on, on Instagram, they make zillions of dollars. Maybe not zillions, but they make lots of money. Their whole point is to influence you. And all the teens and all the adults, they want to be cool, they want to be this, and they follow the counsel and influence of the wicked, of the ungodly. God says, man, blessed is the person, the man, the woman, the girl, the, the boy, who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. You know, when I think about that, (laughs) I think about this. A righteous person needs to learn to discern the counsel of the ungodly. Most don't even uh, know that they're getting counsel or being influenced. They don't even realize it because they're desensitized. Or they're concerned, well, I just, I just want the end result. Does it work for me? Listen, there's a whole way of doing things. I can tell you how to be successful in your business or how to get a relationship with the opposite sex. That's completely ungodly. Now, it might work for you, but it's going to blow up in your face in the long run. There's a way God wants you to do it and the way the world is telling you you should do it. So we need to be able to discern, you, me, uh, how do we do that? There's a, a righteous person also needs to learn to distinguish the ungodly that comes from, from their own minds. W- what do I mean by that? Apart from Jesus, you're selfish. You are. You know how I know that? Because I am too. I wouldn't even be here this morning. I'd be happy to sit in my little PJs without all the pressure and just sit there comfy and I'd, I'd watch... Nate, Gary, or somebody else teach. But that's not what God said to do. And I have to walk in the light of his presence. I have to do what he's telling me to do. 
and when those thoughts come in my head, you can't do this. Why are you up there preaching? Nobody's going to listen to it anyway. Nobody cares what you're... That's what comes through my head. I have to say, wait a minute. No, he has called me to do this. And God's word won't return void. And, 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 and. So whatever you're hearing in your head, we have to learn if that's contrary to God's word, then throw it out. T the Bible says to take your thoughts captive. To, have you ever done that? Captured a little dog? Oh, I'm sorry, we have a little dog. Sometimes they don't want to go in their little pen. They, they can wrestle them in their kid. Take it captive. Make it obedient to Christ. And then lastly, the righteous person needs to find completely godly counsel. And in Psalm 119, if you can turn there with me or scroll there with me, Psalm 119 Verse 24, where, where do we find the counsel? Psalm 119, 24, if you highlight or underline, you should be doing that. Psalm 119, 24, give me just a second to turn there. Oh, yes. It says, your statutes or your laws or your commands or your word are my delight. They are my what? My translation says they are my counselors. That's why we need to fill our mind with God's word. So he's counseling us. Does that make sense? Psalm 32, 8. I, I felt like the Lord had me put this uh, slide together and send it out before I even knew I was going to use it. And God says, I will instruct you and I will teach you in the way you should go. And I will counsel you with my loving eye upon you. God's counsel. So we're cruising right along here. Gary, how long have I been talking? Uh, about 25 minutes. All right. I want to we also have communion today, so we haven't even made it out of verse 1. So if worse comes to worse, I I will stop talking at some point. Gary, just give me a little sign, okay? And then uh Thanks, brother. I appreciate it. I, I don't even, I have no conception of time. I would be here like two hours and you guys would be like, oh my gosh, make him stop. But I just love the Lord and I love his word and I want you to know and to see and taste and see how good it is. I want you to be blessed. Blessed is the man or the woman or the person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked and and it says in the next line, it says, or stand in the way of sinners. Well, first he's just walking along. He's getting counsel. He's just listening to it, right? I'm, I'm not doing it. I'm just listening. I'm just weighing all my options, right? I'm just hearing it. I'm just getting advice. I'm just getting guidance, just getting direction. I'm just listening to the counsel. No big deal. A show here, a YouTube video there. What's the big deal? Listening to my unsaved friends, well, that would work if I did do it that way. Nah, it doesn't honor the Lord, but yeah, it would work. It would get me what I wanted. Huh. It says, who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners. What does that mean? It's almost like he was walking, going from listening and considering to standing. It's almost like, okay, I'm walking, listening, and then all of a sudden I stop. I'm like, and you know what? I could do this. That makes sense. What's the big deal? Everybody's doing it anyway, right? I'm going to stand in that way. And, and I'm, and I'm going to go and do it. Listen, that way, although it seems right, when you're standing in the way of sinners, and it even might be something that the world says is okay, there's a way that seems right unto a man, Proverbs 14, 12 says, but in the end leads to death. There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end leads to death. That way, my friends, is the way of sinners. It's listening to the counsel of wicked and then deciding it's no big deal. I I'm going to go that way. Listen, uh, in, this, in this time of like everybody's a Christian and we're all okay, I'm okay, you're okay. I'm not trying to be legalistic. I, I hate the legalistic religious people. I don't like that either. Jesus called them whitewashed sepulchers and stuff too. But I don't like the, the, the cheap grace where you, you, somehow you could just say the name of Jesus and, and live however way you want. That's not a blessed life. That's not a life that God honors. Listen, 
Matthew 7, 13 talks about the narrow path, talks about the narrow way, right? The two different ways, like someone's talking about. And Jesus said this, not me. Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And just a couple enter through it. Does it say that? Does your Bible say that? Mine says that broad is the way that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But he goes on to say, small is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. And we all know that Jesus is that way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. That way is through his word, his heart, his word, and his Holy Spirit. That's the way of the Lord. If you're a young man or a young woman here and you're thinking, I've got some here that we're doing a great job with worship. And, and I think of them and the ones on, that are listening online right now. And I think to myself, you know, okay, well, how do I keep myself pure in the Lord or, or on the right path or whatever if I'm a young man or young woman? And, and the Bible answers that in Psalm 119. If you could hit that light for me just and leave it off for just a minute. I don't know if that's okay on the, on the screen there, Jay. But it says, how can a young man or person or individual or woman keep his way pure? What does it say? By living according to your word, right? Living according to your word, not just putting it in your head, but applying it, walking in that way, standing and thinking, no, I'm going to live for the Lord instead of for, for sinners. All ages, all applies. Listen to this. I don't know if your Bible, I put it up here to kind of help, but I want you to notice something here. If you notice, blessed. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor seat in the seat of scoffers. Right? Can you see that on the screen? Okay. Blessed is the man. You'll see here uh, a couple sets of things. You'll notice that there are three sets of three. Walks. See that right there? Stands. Sits in the counsel, in the way, in the seat of scoffers. And then the wicked, that's a generic term for, uh, for a person who doesn't follow the Lord. And then the sinners as they're getting more into, and the scoffers. Uh, my Bible says, my translation says mockers. And you see a progression here. So there's three sets of three. What is God trying to show us? And to me, he's showing a progression. He's showing a, 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 a devolution, <laughs> if you will. There seems to be a progression of sin here. Look, at first he's walking in the counsel of the wicked. He's just listening. And then he stops and he stands. He says, yeah, you know what? That's, that's true. And then before long, he's sitting in the seat of scoffers. All of a sudden, as time goes on, he's mocking the things of the Lord. Or he used to be blessing the things of the Lord. He's scoffing at it now. It says he's sitting in the seat of scoffers. You know what that tells me? Sitting in the seat of scoffers? Can I tell you something? When you're sitting down, you're comfortable. Maybe not on these pews that we have right here because they're not very comfy. But when you sit, if I were to sit in this nice chair right here, that shows comfortability. I'm sitting in the seat of scoffers now. I'm at their table. I'm talking with them. I'm walking, not only walking, standing, I'm joining them. Guys, not a good place to be. Listen to this. Turn in your Bibles. Well, maybe I'll just tell you the story for time's sake. <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 13, God, in Genesis chapter 12, I should say, God called Abraham to leave and he said, I'm going to give you a place. You're going to follow me and I'm going to show you. I'm going to make your family as numerous as sands in the seashore. And, and, and he left with his wife, Sarah, and, his, and his, all the servants and his flocks. And, his, and he left to the land God was showing him. And, and one of the people that went with him was Lot, his nephew. And I'm sure you've heard of him. And, and it says that they became so uh, wealthy and so many herds and the land that God was giving them overflowing with milk and honey and whatnot. He said that, that, that they started arguing amongst themselves, Abraham and Lot, and their herdsmen started arguing because there was just not enough resources. And so Abraham, being the godly man that 
that he was, said, you know what, Lot, you choose. Look at the whole land God's given us. You choose where you want to go. We'll separate. We have plenty for all of us. You go, if you go to the right, I'll go to the left. You go to the left, you go to the right. Whatever you want. So it says that Lot, nephew, looked, and he looked kind of worldly. He said, he looked over the Jordan, and he said, ooh, it's all well watered there. It's got everything the world has to offer there. And there's a city there, and a city's named Sodom. Have you ever heard of it? Kind of synonymous with anti-God. Yeah. So it says in Genesis chapter 13 that it says that uh, that when he looked up and Lot, Lot looked up, it says that when he made that choice, it says that Abraham lived in the land of Canaan. He went his way and Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tent near Sodom. And it says in Abraham 13, 13, now the men of Sodom were wicked and are sinning greatly against the Lord. So here he's walking in the council. He's, I'm not, I'm not involved in it. I'm not taking, I'm not in the sin. I'm just near it. I'm just listening to the council. I'm just trading with them. I'm interacting with them, but I'm not, you know, I'm not in it. See, he's walking in the counsel of the wicked. He's just near it. And then if you'll see it progress, kind of sad. And, and, and later on in chapter 14, it, you'll see in verse 12, I'll spare the story, but it says that um, another king came in and it says that they carried off Abraham's nephew Lot and his possessions since he was living in Sodom and Abraham needed to rescue him. See, first he was just walking in the council. Then he was standing in the way of sinners. In fact, he was standing right with them. He was living with them. That's how sin progresses in your life. You're not usually swept away by doing some incredibly dumb thing. Sometimes it happens, but some incredibly dumb thing out of nowhere. Normally it happens a slow bit at a time in your mind or in your thoughts or whatever's going. That's how it works. That's how the enemy works. And then not only that, but wait, there's more. And then it says a little bit later on, and you know the story, I think, Genesis chapter 19. And I won't even tell you all the story because I'm embarrassed to tell you the story. We'll cover it when we cover Genesis. But it says this in Genesis chapter 19, verse 1. It says the two angels arrived in Sodom because well, God was going to destroy it because it was so wicked. This is over time. It says two angels arrived in Sodom the, uh, in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. Now, I'm going to tell you what that means. That lot sitting in the gateway, what they used to do in those old days, you can still see them if you go to Israel. Gary, you've been there. You've probably seen a gate. At the, at the city, they have this big place, and that's where the king, that's where the rulers of the city, that's where those who were the leaders of the city would go, the king or whoever was leading. And he would go and he would sit, and he would hear all the people that came to him. So all of a sudden, he went from near Sodom to living in Sodom and now all of a sudden he's one of the leaders sitting at the gate or sits in the seat of scoffers how did that happen the same way it would happen to you and me Christian don't be so fooled to think that you can't be led astray or you aren't being led astray Holy Spirit open my eyes open our eyes to see this to see what's going on and notice it went from listening and thinking to behaving and acting to belonging. I think, Gary, I'm already at about 45 minutes. <clears throat> and folks, that's verse 1 of Psalm chapter 1. So we've got communion today. So uh, I didn't get very far, but you guys are probably all laughing at home knowing that I wouldn't get very far. And I'm thinking, coming here, wondering if I have enough stuff to say for 45 minutes. So, Pastor Gary, I know you're going to do communion, but I just want to take one second and pray if I can. Yeah. Father, I just, I thank you for your word that doesn't return void. And I pray that everyone listening would come back next week to hear what you have to say, Lord. Because blessed is the man, your word says. And I want to be blessed by you, Lord. Not in the way the world says it or Christian TV says it, but how you say it, Lord. I don't want to 
walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit at the seat of mockers. I don't want to be led along that path. I want to walk in the light and hear your counsel and hear your voice and walk with you and be blessed. Would you help each person that's hearing my voice right now to desire that, to be blessed? And you're going to tell us how to do that in the next verses that we are to meditate on your word day and night, Lord, as that's going to transform our life. Help us this week to do that, to take in your word, to consider your ways, to take it upon ourselves, to not listen to that counsel and that influence. Instead, replace it with godly counsel, with godly influence, with the things that are going to strengthen us in Christ Jesus, Lord, that we can be truly blessed, deeply contented in you. Bless your people and all the hearers that hear this now and online later this week. We pray for your blessing in Jesus' name and bless Pastor Gary. What an awesome man of God he is, Lord. How thankful I am for him, Lord, that he's taking care of everything here while I haven't been able to, Lord. Do an amazing job, Lord. And just bless this short time of communion that we can all partake together, even remotely from home. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Pastor Gary. Please uh, turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 22. It's a passage that we're all familiar with, and I'm not going to read all of it because you have it in front of it, and hopefully you're familiar with it. I admit, this feels a little strange. I'm used to seeing 60, 70 people here and three people handing out uh, the elements, and that, uh, but that's not the case today. And when we first thought about doing, uh, uh, I guess, a, a virtual communion, you know, I asked a couple of pastor friends of mine, well, you know, is this really biblical? And that, well, the truth is, is that yes, as a matter of fact, it is. If you look at uh, uh, verse 9, right, the disciples asked Jesus, where do you want us to prepare for it? You replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparations there. And while we were in, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, we saw uh, what the, they think might be the actual upper room, and it was uh, in a home. And that's so the fact that you're at home today uh, is really a return to the original Passover. So what we're doing is, is very biblical. He goes on in verse 17. After the cup, Jesus gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, you will, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after saying, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Now, we have uh, matzah and grape juice here, and that is we always do. But there's a good chance you don't have that at home. You know, you may have uh, rye, you may have rye toast or hamburger buns. You may have uh, juice, maybe diet coke, coffee, water, milk. I don't know. I know uh, in Matthew uh, 15, I think it's verse 11, Jesus told the disciples, you know, it's not what goes into your mouth that makes you unclean. It's what comes out of your heart mm -hmm. that makes you unclean. Right later on uh, uh, with Peter, he said, you know, don't uh, what what you put into your mouth doesn't make you clean either. And that so it's not really important whether you have matzah and juice What's important is what you have in your heart. Mm -hmm. That's really the elements. What do you have in your heart? Because the Lord is judging your heart. Now, uh, Nathan, would you yeah, actually... Uh, Nathan's going to pass out the elements here. And uh, I'd ask that uh, you take a moment in prayer. Consider this. Uh, when we started and did the announcements... Uh, I included a, a little cartoon, right? And, uh, you know, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And we often think of the church as being this building. And that, but the truth is, is the church is with you. The church is with you in your home. 
right? Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. He doesn't want us to just remember him on Sunday morning when we're sitting in the pews in church. He wants us to remember him when we're sitting in our homes. On Monday, when we have a dispute with our, with our spouse, Tuesday, when uh, our boss gets on our case or something that we think is unfair. Wednesday, when uh, a coworker or, or a, a friend of our student causes a problem, he wants us to remember him and represent him in those situations as well. So I asked that let's take a moment and pray that the Lord would uh, show us the times in our lives that uh, we should uh, remember him and be conv con convicted to be more like him, to be conformed to the likeness of our Savior. And then in a minute or two, uh, we can uh, take the elements together. you told us that uh, this bread was uh, to represent your broken body, the sacrifice that, uh, that you made for us, that we might uh, be reconciled and forgiven, uh, reconciled to our, our Lord God. Father, I ask that now uh, as we take, uh, take this bread uh, in whatever form it might be in our hands, Lord, uh, that we truly do remember the sacrifice that you've made uh, in the call on our life that being Lord gives you. Likewise, Lord, you said that uh, we should take the cup and that it was your blood shed for us. Father, uh, as we take, uh, take the cup, Lord, I ask that uh, you would help us truly to not only remember you now at this holy time, Lord, but we would remember you uh, each and every moment uh, as Pastor taught today, and that uh, help us not to, uh, to stand or walk with the scoffers, Lord. Uh, let us follow that narrow way that draws us ever closer to you and ever closer to our Savior, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, uh, as we close today, I thank you, Lord. Uh, I don't know how to express in words uh, what you've done for me, what you've done for the people that I love, Lord. There are no words. Uh, that can convey that. But Lord, uh, I'll do the best I can. And thank you for, uh, for the word that you've given uh, through Pastor Darren, Lord, uh, that you show us uh, the right way and tell us where the wrong way is as well, Lord. And thank you that we had a time to, to worship you, Lord. Uh, thank you that uh, you brought people to share this experience with us, Lord. Lord, I'd ask that uh, You'd bless your children over the coming week, Lord. Uh, I know you will, Lord. Uh, but help us to see the blessings and be grateful for the blessings. Uh, and, that, uh, and appreciate you for who you are. Not only our Lord, but our Savior. It's in the blessed name of Jesus we pray. All God's children said, Amen. And, and have a blessed week, folks. Lord willing, we'll see you next Sunday.